so it's 3 p.m. Um, and I think we'll get started. Uh, first and foremost, um, thank you everyone for joining us here today um, on this very special, incredibly important day. Um, I hope um, you'll get a chance to also um, join the other series. So I, we can't thank you enough. And Rocky and Nate, super grateful to be here with you. So I'm just gonna um, share a little bit about this session and, um, and then we'll take it from there. So as I just said, today is National Fentanyl Awareness Day, the second ever national activation um, event to spread awareness about the illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Um, this session is one of five, one of a five part series today that brings together an array of experts tackling this problem from various angles. We aim to offer our audience a diverse, accurate, and informed perspectives about fentanyl in the effort to raise awareness and save lives. The scope of our conversation will be about the different paths to common ground as it pertains to prevention efforts, mental health and substance use disorder. Each of our guests are experts in their field and they come with different perspectives. We often hear, or I often hear through the over a decade of my work, we don't know what we don't know. We are hopeful that regardless of the work or your family or the passion behind those of you listening with us today that you can walk away with unique perspectives. Um, I say unique perspectives because I think you'll see that Nate and Rocky and myself come from different lenses. Doesn't mean that the unique is right or wrong, but again, we come from different pathways and I hope together um, we can share a little bit of our experience, a little bit of our work and, and how we've been working in this space. Um, as far as myself, I'm going to do a quick brief intro. I always try to be brief and then I'm going to hand it over to Rocky and Nate. Um, so as my name it appears on the screen, I'm Denise Mariano. I have been, um, I am a family affected by substance use disorder um, for the past 13 years, um, completely blindsided. And I found out 12 years ago that I found my purpose um, and left the professional field because I thought I needed to be part of change or make a difference um, if I could. And I began this journey with um, sharing my story in schools to both families and youth um, and really just to help destigmatize or remove judgment. Um, I never was ashamed, we were never ashamed of our son. And so what we shared in addition to our stories is, is all the what ifs. You know, what if we knew? What if we talked about the first day of addiction instead of the last day of addiction, right? Looks very different. What if I knew that positive behaviors in my son, in my child, were red flags, okay? Again, we talk about the last day when, when they're spiraling. And what if I knew mental health was the root of so much of my son's beginning of his years, right? He seemed like a happy guy, sports, academically, right? A comedian, I'll never forget when I, we went to our first therapy session that his comedic behaviors were just him wanting to be loved. Um, and so that's where I began my journey. Um, as a family member, um, I saw all the failed systems of care for families, um, just every door closed, being labeled a codependent, um, enabler, door shut, judged. So for the next 12 years, I worked at a large nonprofit, um, just building a community for families. And that was for direct programs and supports, but, but more so, supporting all supporters, not just family members, but grandparents, foster parents, and really educating them that they can be part of the solution. And most importantly, evidence tells us that um, we can love our person through this, right? We don't have to punish them. And then I made the crazy decision only three weeks ago um, to jump shit after 12 years. And many would ask why, and, and, I, and I think it's important that I share why. Um, I went to Song for Charlie three weeks ago. I did that for a few reasons. This landscape has changed. We're not even getting our people into the failed systems of care and we have to catch our youth upstream. So I'm almost going back to my original purpose where I started in schools and with families. And I found with Song for Charlie, it was the first organization that 
not only talked about solutions and education, but came, came at this in a positive way. Um, and they're deep parts. And um, that's not easy to find in today's space that there's so many different opinions. So super grateful for that. I'm glad to be back into my original purpose. Um, and I couldn't have chosen a better space to work in. And I wouldn't be here with Nate and Rocky um, if I didn't make that decision. So I would love for to introduce you all to, to Rocky Heron and Nate. And Rocky, I'm gonna start with you if you can just um, share your story, share your work and why you're here today. Um, and why do you do the work you do, Rocky? Well, I, I do it for families like yours, Denise. Uh, congratulations, uh, welcome to the family. Uh, song for Charlie is wonderful. So my name is Rocky Heron. I, I started in, uh, as a special agent with the DEA way back in 1990, uh, the cocaine wars and all, and I retired from DEA in 2021. So I spent 31 years uh, on the ground, uh, mostly here in San Diego and, and Tijuana, and then some time in South America as a DEA special agent arresting drug traffickers. In around 2008, uh, three things happened almost simultaneously that changed me. Uh, first, I was arresting a whole bunch of beautiful young people, um, young drug dealers from really good families, good communities, not traditional drug dealers. And they were young kids who'd gotten addicted to smoking Oxycontin and, and, and because of their addiction needs, they became drug dealers. And that's why we got involved. And as I would drive these beautiful young kids to jail, men and women, I'd ask them, you know, why did you start? When did you start? And they'd all cry. They all start crying and they'd say, man, I wish somebody would have warned me. I wish somebody would have told me how bad it was going to be. And at that time, I looked at him and said, I don't think you would have listened. Uh, and then I discovered that my my own daughter in fifth grade in California wasn't getting any drug prevention in schools. And I naively assumed, I think like most parents probably still do, that schools are doing some kind of education around this and they're not. And then I discovered that overdoses had climbed from 10,000 at the beginning of my career to 40. And I realized that we were failing as a society. You know, we, in fact, were not educating our kids. And I knew it was always going to be a low odds thing. You know, we talked to a thousand kids. I don't know how many are going to change their behavior, but we owe it to them to give them the information. So I did a talk for my daughter and her friends. And by word of mouth, it spread. Um, it became a major part of what I did with DEA. Um, and I retired a year and a half ago, took a job with the San Diego County Office of Education as their alcohol and uh, other drug prevention ambassador. So I do most of my work in San Diego, but I'm working with schools in CUNA, Idaho, and Redding, California, Hollister, California, and I just got back from teaching in Mexico. So this, this is a global drug consumption problem, uh, and my work is to get in front of as many kids as I can to give them the truth uh, from the perspective of a DE agent so they have that information before they make the choices that change their lives. And that's why I do this work. Thank you, Rocky. I love the way you approach this as beautiful young kids. You know, so often people think that these young adults and children, it's a moral failing. Mm -hmm. um, these are not bad people. These are good people trying to get well or just finding some, you know, uh, silence in their heads. So I so appreciate and love that. Um, so Rocky, what prevention efforts are you currently practic practicing in the schools? And why does the current drug and fentanyl landscape make this work even more important now more than ever? Well, I do assembly-based education and many people think that's not adequate. They don't think it's enough. My marketing argument, it's better than nothing, Denise. Mm -hmm. So I, in the hour or now 90 minutes that many schools give me, I give them as complete a picture as I can about what the money people spend on drugs does to our country and other countries, how it harms through addiction and it harms our development. And I make the message repeatedly. My, my program is called, I Choose My Future. And I tell the kids from the beginning, you're responsible. You're going to make the choices that determine who you become. And, and while you live in a culture that makes it seem like drug use is normal and everybody's doing it, that's not true. And you certainly don't have to do it too. And it's amazing. I, I do huge audiences and I'll get a thousand kids for this very serious lecture showing them many sad things. And they're cheering and clapping at the end because they, they appreciate being spoken to like that. I'm not talking at them. I'm talking to them. And I'm putting the responsibility square in their hands saying, look, I need you to be thinking. I don't know if any of you are listening, but I'm going to be here doing this anyway, hoping that some of you are. And it's it's hardly enough. Uh, I certainly think it's amazing that we're finally coming together as a society and we're getting different perspectives and people from, you know, who've been in addiction and the families who've lost children, the families currently suffering, uh, you know, psychologists and doctors. And that. It, it, this is really that cliche, all, all hands on deck. Um, and, and the kids in the past in these could experiment with drugs and not die. Mm -hmm. And and uh, with fentanyl, it's different. And too many kids are not taking fentanyl unknowingly and being poisoned by it. 
and, and, and too many other kids are playing with it, thinking that they, they somehow know better than, and, they, and they lose the, the fentanyl game. So we're in a fentanyl crisis, um, but that's because we're in a self-medication crisis and that's because we're in a mental health crisis. So there's multiple layers here that are driving uh, the problem, but fentanyl is, is so powerful and so deadly that we have to approach this differently and right now. Thank you, Rocky. We're definitely going to circle back to this um, because I think we have lots of thoughts about this and and really care about this conversation a lot. And especially when you um, you mentioned it's up to them to make choices. So I definitely want to circle back to say, how can we as a society, even the three of us here, schools and families, help them make those good choices? Um, but for now, Nate, I would love to hear your story why you're involved with this work. And um, if you can share that with everyone here, that would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, so I'm one of the people who struggled with substance use as a young person. Um, Rocky described them as beautiful young people. I was definitely a young person. I don't think many people would use the adjective beautiful to describe me, but I appreciate it, Rocky. <laughs> um, so I was one of those young people who struggled as a youth. And, you know, Rocky talked a lot about drug prevention. And I remember, I think the only time that I really heard a lot about drugs was when I was in kindergarten and we had a D.A.R.E. officer come in um, and, you know, D.A.R.E. gets kind of a bad rap. And I think it could have been better. But like, as Rocky said, now there's a, there's not much going on at all. And at least they were talking about it. Um, but as a kid, you know, I struggled with mental health. And Denise, you alluded to that earlier. And one of the things that I struggled with deeply was depression and social anxiety as a kid. I can remember um, being, I mean, as young as second or third grade, even kindergarten, uh, not wanting to be around my peers simply because I felt different than everybody. Um, I always felt like I was somebody from Mars dropped off on planet Earth and everybody else was an Earthling and they all know how to interact with each other. And, you know, my, my biggest concern was, you know, I was one of those kids sweating when we were reading a book in class because I thought I was going to get called on. And I was so scared that I was going to mess up. Uh, but I had I had love and support. My parents told me they loved me. They told me I could be anyone I wanted to be. But I didn't believe it. So, you know, we talked about self-medicating. And that's what most people with substance use do is we medicate ourselves. There's something going on internally that makes us feel um, like we're not right in our own skin. Right. And that was certainly true for me. So I started to act out because I didn't know how to verbalize these things. And I think a lot of kids struggle when they have mental health, they're not sure how to say to their parents, to their peers, to their teachers, I feel this way, I don't know what to do, help me to figure out what's going on. So what I did was what most kids do is I acted out and I started to have behavioral issues. So my parents is, you know, were loving and they cared about me. So they took me to a child psychiatrist. Um, and similar to the opioid crisis, you know, we were gonna treat the world's pain. You know, pain's the fifth vital sign. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with ADD and I think a lot of kids have been diagnosed with ADD when they have uh, behavioral problems. And if you have ADD, there are very helpful medications out there. However, I was just a young person who didn't know how to verbalize my feelings. Uh, so I got put on Adderall at a very young age. And that was my first experience with substances. You know, I had, I had one group of people telling me, uh, substances are bad. Drugs are bad. Don't take them. And then I had people over here saying, take these drugs are going to make you feel good. And they did make me feel good. And one of the things they didn't talk about in D.A.R.E., and, you know, Rocky has mentioned this before, and we had some of our meetings leading up to this, was what well, I think we don't do a good enough job is telling kids that it's going to feel good. Drugs do feel good uh, and prepare them for that. So, you know, if you tell kids, like when we were kids, they say, if you smoke a joint, uh, you're going to end up homeless under a bridge, you're going to die. Well, we all smoke a joint and we're having fun, we're laughing, we're eating pizza, we're watching cartoons. We thought, well, the adults lied to us. They just don't want us to have any fun, just like. When, you know, when you're a kid and your parents are to do something, you can't think five years in the future, but they can. So you just think your parents are no fun. They're lame. Um, so I started to experiment with drugs after I got on the Adderall. And then, as I'm sure, you know, Rocky heard and, you know, Denise as well, uh, I got injured playing sports in high school. And that is when I had my introduction to pain pills. Um, and what we know now is that opioids work better on emotional and mental pain than they even do physical pain. I think many people on this call can identify that Stubbing your toe sucks, but a pain that is deep internal is much harder to shake than stubbing your toe. <laughs> it, your toe feels better in about 30 minutes. Uh, but if you get broken up with, it, it takes a few days. And, and for a kid, a few days is a very long time. So when I took that uh, opioid for the first time, I always describe it as a semi-spiritual experience. 
I felt like I found my answer to life. I thought this is how I should feel every single day for the rest of my life, no matter what it takes, because that was that missing piece. I felt like I had a missing puzzle piece in my brain. And when I plugged in the opiates, the light bulb went on. And I thought, my God, where has this been my entire life? So the rest of my days really became chasing that down. I ended up having three shoulder surgeries in high school uh, due to playing sports. And I went to college to play sports with a scholarship athlete. But as you can imagine, um, the, the pain pills, you know, the DEA did a great job and they shut down a lot of these pill mills. But what we didn't always think about, and Rocky will talk more about this. He's the expert on, on the drug trafficking and all these things. But we had a bunch of opioid uh, pe people addicted to opioids physically, right? And we took away the pill supply. That's when heroin came in and I ended up on IV heroin. Um, and I came from a good home. It happens to everybody. Uh, but, you know, I talk to the kids a lot in my prevention efforts about escapism, wanting to escape these negative feelings. And we tell them a lot about brain science and dopamine, uh, just trying to hit them with facts, not scare tactics, uh, not hyperbole, uh, but, but what really happens to you physiologically, um, uh, physiologically when, when you take drugs. So I became physically dependent. I ended up homeless multiple times, multiple overdoses. Of course, eventually the heroin supply became laced with fentanyl. Um, so I ended up homeless. I ended up overdosing. A lot of my friends have since passed away. I'm 31 years old. Uh, I celebrated six years in recovery uh, last week. So, you know, that getting into recovery, I found that everything that I went through and everything that my family went through, that all of that didn't happen for, you know, basically lack of term for no reason. And so I decided that I was going to go talk to people that were going through this and I saw, you know, as Denise and Rocky have alluded to, that people aren't making it to, um, you know, I, I use from 12 to 24. People aren't making it for 12 years to, 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 to burn their life to the ground and say, you know what, I've had enough. I'm going to get sober. I was, I was lucky by the grace of God to survive my overdoses, uh, but so many people are not. So, you know, now what I do is I go around, I talk to kids, I talk to adults. Um, I, I try to share with them the facts about fentanyl. You know, we talk about one pill can kill, uh, but even aside from that, if one pill doesn't kill, just things, again, that can happen to you psychologically within the brain and physically when you start to take drugs. And we tell kids that they have choice. Kids are smart. If you, if you lie to them or mislead them, they're going to, they can Google you in two seconds. And if they, if you, if you like about one thing, everything you say come, that's coming out of your mouth now is bull crap, <laughs> you know? So really that's how I got to where I'm at. And those, that's just like a little bit of the prevention efforts that I've involved in, um, you know, I've got a first first hand look, obviously, from from a user's perspective with the fentanyl and the xylazine that are now on the scene. But I'm also on our local overdose fatality review team. Um, so we've gotten to see, you know, just just the devastation firsthand and how important these prevention efforts are. Thank you, Nate. Um, first and foremost, congratulations on your recovery um, and your selfless work. I think we all you know, find our purpose, in, including Rocky, right? His was his daughter, right? That first talk and seems like ours mirror each other a little bit different lens and family. Um, before I go to Rocky as, as a follow-up, I just wanted to highlight a few things um, for our audience, excuse me. We spoke about your anxiety, um, your depression, right? And so, so I definitely want to see where can we do better with that, right? How can, we're saying we're giving our youth choices, but if we're not gonna support them in sharing those choices with us or how they're feeling and bookend it at the school level with the teachers and the coaches and everyone else and, and create a safe place of non-judgment um, and really a place where they can come share. Um, I, I definitely wanna get into that. Um, but I also, I'm going to come from my lens and then go to you, Rocky. So, you know, Nate um, spoke about that instant gratification, using substances to feel good until they didn't feel good anymore, right? Um, and a lot of depression and anxiety. What I would like to share with you, especially with my work um, with youth, um, is, is to share a few more reasons or triggers. And it could be a, is is what we think as adults, minimal as a breakup, a relational breakup. It sends them into a spiral of depression and sadness. So we have breakups. We have, you know, not even making that sports team that you're on 
Nate, when I think about it, right? You have so much competition now. Sports is not when um, I grew up and label myself where you you tried out for a team and you made it and played for the love. It's to win, right? Um, it could be like our son going away to college and being away from his family for the first time. So just want our audience to think about all the different variables that go on in our young people's brain and how can we um, support them in that and ask them open-ended questions like how do you feel what does that feel like um, so I really love that and I appreciate it Nate so Rocky tell us what do you find in your prevention efforts um, that are most effective and then your thoughts on you walk out of that assembly how does the work continue you're the messenger right you've taken that first step what can the schools do? What can families do? What can the professionals that might be in this audience do to follow up on that message? Well, it's my belief that a lot of the kids um, leave the assemblies feeling empowered. And I make the point that I don't think drug users are bad people. I think they're beautiful people and I have empathy for them. You know, so I, I remove the stigma hard. I try anyway against, the, you know, the people who've chosen to use. And, uh, you know, it, it Schools have told me that my one assembly has changed their school, which is kind of incredible, right? But I think it's such a powerful assembly that's such a strong information in the assembly that it does change the conversation for the students and for the teachers. Uh, and of course, you know, prevention can't just happen in the schools. It needs to really, really happen in the homes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I do parent presentations as, as invited, but very few parents come. Um, but I, I'm hoping that parents can just learn to make themselves a safe place for the conversation. You know, like you said, ask those open-ended questions. How are you doing? Hey, I saw this guy talking about drugs. Is this stuff really happening in your world? What are you seeing at the parties? You know, I, and, and just make yourself a safe place for the kids to come talk. And, and I also talk about social media and I, and I talk about how this generation of kids is documented, most depressed, most anxious, most lonely we've ever had. You know, 44% of our, our teens self-identified as, you know, persistently sad and hopeless. And, and that data came out last year and, and it didn't cause a national crisis conversation, Denise. Yeah. richest country in the history of the world and ha almost half of our teenagers say I, i'm pretty much sad all the time and and we don't react as a society and then we scratch our heads like geez well why are they using substances and you know and i call it the tragic moment so social media has taught kids that you don't share your your problems on social media because you'll be bullied and mocked if social media has taught our kids that everybody else is perfect so if you're feeling sad or lonely or insecure like nate did then you must be like uniquely especially broken because everybody else seems perfect so they're not telling their friends they're not talking to their parents and they're carrying that pain around inside them. And, and, and where fentanyl is so horrible is they go to the party and, and someone offers them this drug. They're completely unprepared to understand what it is. And, you know, thank God most people don't die from the first use. But too many just experience what Nate did in a, in a semi-religious experience. I mean, these kids that I arrested smoking OxyContin, which was much less powerful than fentanyl, would tell me, Rocky, once I smoked Oxy, I found what I've been looking for. And what they meant was they found emotionally you know, a way to escape from all that pain. And, and sadly, to today, with its, whether it's fentanyl or the 99% pure meth or the 95% potent THC, the kids who are carrying around all this pain, when they try these drugs, some of those kids are sort of psychologically hooked from that first use. And as much as they might know it's dangerous, they're going to go back and lie to themselves and say, I'll just do it one more time. I'll just do it one more time. And very quickly, they're in addiction. So the goal that I do is to hit hard and early. I mean, er, I'm even talking to fifth and sixth graders now with 90 minute assemblies, mm -hmm. um, very powerful information. So they have that, you know, So and I tell them and I teach refusal skills and I make them understand that you will be offered drugs and you need to be prepared. And you can lie to those people. You can say, you can tell them whatever you need to say, just, just say no thanks. That's what I tell the kids, right? And the next time somebody offers you drugs, please just look at them and say no thanks. And you'll save yourself from a lifetime of misery. That's great, Rocky. And, and I... um I love that you're just doing so much more than don't do drugs. No, yeah. right? Because I think what happened in the landscape, and you can correct me, we had the D.A.R.E. program, which was don't do drugs, right? Fear-based. And then we had nothing. And now we're kind of reimagining what this can look like. And, and so grateful that we're talking about this. I want to also pick up on the social media. I'm so glad that you brought that up. I think some of our speaker series today are will be speaking to, you know, um, getting illicit, you know, fake fentanyl pills on social media, but um, the really important and powerful comment that you made is just our kids on that social media every day. And it just feeling lonely out there, 
I wanted to also highlight that the Surgeon General did an amazing, powerful, and impactful article on loneliness this week. If I can share it with the team and, and we can share that with you. Um, and a perfect example of even as we get older, Rocky, I can remember our son um, being about eight months in recovery and going on Facebook and relapsing or re having a reoccurrence because he looked out into the world and said, I should still be in college. Mm -hmm. I should still be doing these things. And so really hard to tell your children not to look at Facebook. So as adults, you know, all we could do is try to lift them up instead of kick them down. Um, but I noticed that, you know, perfectionism and um, it plays a huge toll and there's bullying. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that in there again for our audience, for family members have this discussion. Don't talk to them, right? But just say, here's what I learned today on my series. Do you experience that? And what does it feel like? And how can I help you? Instead of talking out them, let them talk to you. So really appreciate that, Rocky. Um, Nate, I know a little bit about more of your story and about your recovery and the work that you're doing today. So my question to you is, if you could share a little bit with us, um, especially about the great work that you're doing um, with the police officer and what that meant to you, and then kind of take it to the next step and say, how can we better support those struggling with substance use disorder and or mental health? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think you referenced was the police officer, and that's the one in my story who um, really, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, when I go around to schools, I go around with an organization called Remedy Live, and they came out of um, a, a desire for several people in our local community here in Northeast Indiana who had a heart for young people who talked about, you know, it started out as an online radio station. And the reason they started out that way is because they turned on the radio one day, all they heard was crap. <laughs> and so they decided, how do we connect with kids and send them a positive message, right? So we go around to schools and talk to kids about all these different things and escapism. But where I met this man, this, this detective who, you know, because we tell kids all the time, you got to find a trusted adult. Now, mind you, I was 24 when I got sober. We all know when you start using substances, a young person, it slows down your, um, your, your mental and emotional development, right? So I was probably really about a 15 year old mentally and emotionally when I was 24. Um, so what happened was I had two uh, overdoses or poisonings, if, if you would, uh, of fentanyl in 24 hours, right? And the, the first responders came in and it was the same shift of first responders both times. And the first time I did it, I was locked in the bathroom. They had to smash down the door. They had to give me Narcan, Naloxone, which reverses an opioid overdose. Um, and they took me to the hospital. Then I came back to the house and locked myself in the bedroom and then the bedroom bathroom did it again, they had to smash down two more doors to get to me. And they were just at a complete loss, right? And I'm sure some people on this call, maybe your first responders, you see the same people over and over and over again, and it's incredibly disheartening. And this man, his name is uh, Sergeant Gerardo, and he's the vice narcotics detective, a veteran of the force, probably very similar to Rocky, uh, his story. And he was on his way home, and he was. He told me that after, we, after this all happened, he told me he was just tired of putting young people into uh, body bags and sitting there with their families and having to explain to them that they're not coming home. Um, and so he got the call that a 24 year old had dope, overdosed twice in 24 hours. And he came in, he sat down next to me. And in that moment, he just simply told me how much he believed in me and he thought that I could do this. And he wanted to try something different. He could have taken me to jail, but he saw how many people he took to jail and within 72 hours, they're back out on the street doing the same thing. He's gonna pick them up again tomorrow or he's gonna find them at a motel somewhere. Um, overdosed. So he decided to sit down and have a conversation with me and he offered me a way out. He offered me the ability to go and get help. And he, he personally made sure I got there. So what he and I do now is we go around and we talk to police departments about the importance of doing things differently, of having alternative programming for people that you come across and the importance of talking to kids when you come across them who maybe you're picking them up for shoplifting or you're at the school talking to them in the school resource officer and not dismissing them as this kid just a punk that right. having somebody that they can believe in a trusted adult they can go to who can say you are worth more sometimes you're the only person that's telling that kid that and maybe if you're not you're the one that they're going to look up to the fact that a police officer when i was a 24 year old um you know person with substance use disorder who was a criminal and i was engaging in criminal activity on a regular basis um, who could have been taken to jail to have somebody tell me that they believed in me in that moment and that I could do this was huge for me. 
So that's what he did. Um, and from there, we started our own kind of platform on Facebook called Bare Knuckle Recovery, where we have people who do things like that on. And we put on a podcast and then we go around and talk to kids with Remedy Live at the schools. And one of the books we use, which I would encourage everyone to read. Some of you probably have read it. You know, if, if you haven't, it's wonderful. It's called Dopamine Nation, um, which is what we based a lot of our escapism teaching on. Uh, and really what we talk to kids about is the same thing that Rocky was talking about and you, the social media. And that's all based on escaping reality and going somewhere where it's, it's not, social media is not the truth, right? It's everybody's highlight reel of their life. And we see that the more they see others doing these things, like you talked about with your son, I can identify as far as somebody who struggled for years, seeing my friends graduate from high school, they're getting married, they're having children, mm -hmm. and I'm over here thinking I'm a complete failure. And mm -hmm. so with my depression and anxiety, it just made it worse and worse and compounded it. So giving people an alternative to that is vitally important. And that's really what we try to focus on is giving them alternatives. Thank you, Nate. I'm going to really powerful. And I, I usually cry and I'm not going to do it today, but we started this conversation off with, you didn't believe in yourself, but somebody believed in you, right? Um, and, and knew you were worthy enough for help, right? And I think if we as human beings, whether we're doing prevention and want to loop back to that, if we can have some compassion, empathy, and understanding, whether it be that 12-year-old that has anxiety, to sit in it with them and to listen, not to talk, to listen, um, and just let them know they are worthy um, and help them believe in themselves. My next question is, how do we reimagine prevention? I've kind of just answered what, what I would like to say about it, um, that we need to send that message that we believe in you, that you're worth it, that you can share with us, right? Because whether that person um, applaud the children um, that are not looking for substances, right? But those that even reach out on, on Snapchat or I shouldn't even, all social media, Instagram, Facebook, all of them, whether they're, regardless of who they've reached out to, they've reached out for a reason. There's a why behind they're reaching out, right? The same thing with you, Nate, and my son. There's a reason why they were using illicit drugs, right? And today they're just not making it. So I, I want to ask you, Rocky and Nate, and I'm, I'll wrap up this question as well. How do we reimagine prevention? What tactics, messages, strategies can work well? It could be something, you know, and, and Rocky, you already shared what you're doing. Um, but if you could give any advice to those in our audience, in addition to the assemblies, um, how can we do better here? How can we re reinvent it so that we're not sitting in a health class and getting the stats on marijuana, so that we're not doing fear? And so more importantly, those students, whether in an assembly or a classroom, truly believe we're on their side when they walk out. Well, I think we need to reimagine our whole education system. And I think we need to start, you know, first grade kindergarten with character building and and social responsibility and anti-bullying. And I think there's a whole scaffolding of interventions that the schools, you know, should, and eventually I think they will have to assume, right, to, to, to help prevent kids from being in emotional crisis when they hit their early teenagers, to provide, try to prevent future generations of young Nates, you know, out there trying to navigate a cold, frightening, scary world by themselves. And we have to normalize. I tell the kids, I say it's BS that these young kids look at social media and think that they're broken. Everybody is depressed. Everyone who's ever been a teenager, you know, transitioning from a child to adulthood is complicated and hard. And everybody experiences at times depression and loneliness and anxiety. And you have to learn how to work through it. But um, we live in a culture that's telling the kids medicate. And if we tell them on TV all day, every day through the pharmaceutical ads, medicate with our prescription drug. And then of course, social media and the movies and the TikToks, hey, uh, oh, you should medicate with our party drugs. And I don't blame our kids for growing up in a world where they think chemicals are going to solve their problems and they won't, they won't. And like Nate's, Nate's analogy was great. You know, that the, the opioids will solve your physical pain temporarily, but the, the emotional pain they're living in is far greater. So I really think it's going to take a, a reimagining of our entire education system. And that's not even close to happening. Nobody in Washington's having any serious conversation that I'm aware of about what we're talking about today. And I don't get it. I've been screaming this for 16 years. The first generation of grieving parents I dealt with was back, you know, 15, 14 years ago. And, and now with fentanyl, it's just gotten that much worse. And in spite of all this pain and suffering, 
we're not having a different talk. Like, what can we actually do differently? So this conversation today is amazing. Uh, I love being here with you both. And I'm hoping that people in our audience can take away from this conversation that they, in their own world, can become ambassadors for prevention. Go to their schools. Hey, what are you doing for our kids? If not, why don't you bring somebody in? Um, change the conversation with your own kids. Lobby your politicians. Let's get some money. Let's get some mandates to get prevention back into schools. You know, let's 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 put aside this belief that prevention doesn't work. Uh, and, and understand that, you know what, maybe it doesn't work well, but it works better than nothing. And, and Denise, you know, if we don't start fighting back hard today, where are we going to be in five years? Now, I've been saying that for 16 years, and I'm going to say it again today. If mm -hmm. we don't start fighting back hard today, we're going to be very sorry in five years. Yeah, yeah, that, that's so powerful. And um, we must have that different talk. Um, and we can't, again, there's this blame game that goes around, Right it's the social medias that's where they got their pills it's this person it's the schools the blame can go everywhere but as individuals um here today we can be those new messengers we can be that ambassador rocky that you speak of and we can have these different conversations um i hope it you know i know a lot of people are trying it i hope this empowers people walking away and they come back with questions and say how can we get involved and again it can come from different lenses um, but really important. Uh, Nate, I'm going to throw that at you. I think you've probably, um, we're probably beating a dead horse, but it shows our passion and how that this different talk needs to happen. And we can't continue to blame um, all the big organizations and everyone around us. And I think we have to take some accountability as individuals, as teachers, as, you know, uh, professionals, as family members, um, and really change this conversation and reimagine it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, Rocky said it well, you know, we, we teach kids that, you know, social media, you know, these drugs are the answer. Um, I'll go even further and say that, you know, the, the book Dopamine Nation talks about we have a dopamine economy. You turn on the TV and what are all the commercials? People smiling, driving a Toyota, getting McDonald's. Hey, we got external solutions to your internal problem. More stuff, more dopamine, more drugs, you're going to feel better, right? And we're setting kids up to fail. Because they they feel they feel bad in here, but we're telling them the answer is all out here. We have to focus on what's in here and up here with the kids. And I think one thing we do a poor job of is empowering our young people. You want to talk about prevention? They need to be empowered that they have the ability to be involved in change. They could be leaders in their own communities. The school in and of itself is a, is, is a community within a community. We need to empower these kids to know that they can be part of the change. I think the problem is we, you know, like Rocky, we sit them in these classrooms and we tell them, well, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. They need to be involved in this process of change. I mean, the, the opposite of addiction is human connection. I feel like we've gotten mm -hmm. so far away from human connection mm -hmm. when it comes to kids. I mean, even, even most, you know, half, half the classes are virtual now. And I understand sometimes it's easier for kids that way, that's fine. But I think that we've gotten so far away from human connection and empowering young people. I think that's how we have to reimagine prevention. And that's why, you know, I think the stats are important, but we also have to tell them, you know, when I was a kid, one of the things that I didn't really understand was, yes, drugs feel good. So nobody told me drugs are, are gonna feel good and they didn't tell me how good they were gonna feel, but also that, that temporary feeling of feeling good only lasts for a short period and for every high there's a low. Mm -hmm. And what feels even better is those dreams you had as a kindergartner, the, the, the individuals who sat in that classroom. When I was in kindergarten, you asked me what I want to be when I grow up. I didn't say I want to be 24, I want to be homeless and I want to be addicted to heroin and fentanyl and I want to steal from Walmart to support my habit. You know, and, and I want to break my parents heart. That's not what I said. I wanted to be uh, a police officer. Right. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. We need to get kids to understand that they can do those things. I don't think kids feel that they can do those things. I think if we tell kids a lot of times what they can't do, they need to know that it feels infinitely better. The highs aren't as high and the lows aren't as low, but it's such a so much more of a um, fulfilling feeling to fulfill those dreams and to be part of a community and part of a culture where where, where you take responsibility and you're helping others. And I think that we've just gotten so far away from that. And mm -hmm. kids are so hopeless. They don't have a purpose. Um, and you've got so many different people yelling so many different things at you from so many different directions. You know, it's no wonder that kids are reaching for a drug to kind of tune out and just feel better and escape into their own little world. 
Um, it's much easier for me in today's world to see, and I did it back then, but even now, it'd be easier for me to go, you know, smoke a joint and then get on my phone and scroll TikTok for hours, you know, at least I'm killing time and I feel good and I'm safe while I'm doing it. So again, I think it lies in empowerment, uh, giving them choices. Um, you know, I, I think we just need to really do a better job of telling kids they can do whatever they want to do. And I don't think we engage them enough. I think that's Rocky was getting at too with the education yep. system. Yep. Kids need to be doing things, right? Like, I think sometimes just sitting in a classroom and, and taking information out and, and then spitting it back. I remember as a kid, I didn't feel like I, I couldn't see the I couldn't see the connection between my future life and what I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really matter to me. That's great, Nate. And I will share from a family hat two things. I wish when we re when we reimagine the prevention efforts. And, and Rocky, you mentioned nobody shows up, right? The families don't show up. And until we're in it, we don't in it or part of the problem. And so I wished way back then, and I hope we can reframe it going forward, that when we have these family talks at schools, regardless of where they are, instead of labeling it the drug talk you need to know to save your kid or, you know, um, fentanyl will you know one pill can kill which is true just let me finish this and all these fear you know titles to get them how about if we just serve it up as the mental health wellness and whole health of your children imagine if we reframed it that way on back to school do we think maybe more people would come and then not only are we reframing it in a better way right just in and they could feel that they are part of it right we can have all those discussions. We can talk about the fake pills. It's so important that we talk about that. We can talk about their mental health and we can really have those discussions of what these talks could look like at home and taking the stresses off of these kids academically, sports-wise and so forth. I think the other thing that I would like to reimagine, especially in the school systems, um, is when they do come and share, let's not create this this environment of punishment. And just to give that some clarity, I will never forget, you know, first time our son was in trouble in school, Nate, not for bad behavior, but comedic behavior, I can remember, right? But just being a nuisance, you know? Um, and the first thing they did was take away his ability to play baseball. So what you've done there is you've taken a positive reinforcer in their life, have punished them. And what are they doing with their time now? So we could talk about this forever and probably create one cheaters. Um, but I love talking about this. And I think we have to reimagine it if we're going to look at the uh, lives of our youth going forward and saving lives. Um, so really appreciate that. We have some questions, I think, in the chat. So I'm going to do that for a couple minutes. There's, uh, some of them are two paragraphs long, so I'm gonna try to find the question out of them. Uh, let's see. This one's for Nate. Congratulations on your recovery. I'm curious what can replace the feelings that many get from drugs and alcohol. For example, creating alternative therapies that are expensive, that are expressive in nature, art, help lift that mood. I think you spoke about that a little bit. And what are your, what are your thoughts? Hip hop, rap therapy also seems promising. Have you worked with anybody um, in this space and what you found helpful to some of the uh, individual yeah. recovery you're working with? Well, it's a very, uh, you know, the answer is very individualized. It depends on the person. Different things connect with different people for different reasons. Some people are very into art therapy. Some people are into music therapy. I think it's finding what works for, for those individuals. One thing that I really enjoyed was iron therapy, which I like to go to the gym and work out. Um, something that helps get that creativity flowing, something that helps get the dopamine in the brain, which at the end of the day, I mean, pretty much all of our feelings are, are just chemicals in our brain, right? <laughs> so if we can do healthy things that are sustainable to recreate that, people have a fighting chance um, and everybody has different things that they, that they look for. So just offering people options and getting them to try new things uh, really is, I think, the most important part. Uh, you know, I had to try a lot of different things and I tell people not to just pick one thing, but pick multiple things. You know, maybe you have your top one that you really enjoy, but you know, that's, that's what I would say about that. That's great. Appreciate that. And this one is for you. 
Rocky, at what age do you start talking to kids? You mentioned some of this with your daughter. Should they grow up first with this talk? Should they grow up or talk early? And I think we know the answer to this. The messaging could look different, but I, I think we could all maybe hit upon this one a little bit. And Rocky, I'll start with you. Well, I think the substance abuse talk can start very young. I mean, you can see people out smoking or vaping in public to your little kids and say, oh, isn't that gross? And why would somebody put foreign things in your body? I mean, you can start that conversation very early and talk about the importance of good food and, you know, and, and, and keeping yourself strong and, and how important it is to develop to the full extent that you're able, right? And then, you know, it depends regionally, you know, in San Diego, there are schools down in the fifth grade asking me to come in because the, the school administrators are seeing the drug problem. Other places it's happening later, but you know, it's just start the messaging very young. And I, the reimagining, if we actually came up with school systems that created much more nurturing environments for the kids, I think we'd have a lot less, a lot less people seeking that self-medication. And I'm going to turn that one over to you, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I think that honestly, uh, you know, it, it it's not too, I think it, it, elementary school is when you start talking about it, really. I mean, you know, I there was a rural school in a rural school in Indiana that we went to where we did the middle school and high school, and they asked us to come back to the elementary school because they had kids as you know, third grade coming to school with THC vapes, you know, from their siblings or their parents or whoever. So having that uh, as early as possible, just to educate kids, and you don't have to scare the crap out of them, but just help help them understand why these things may be harmful to them. Definitely don't take anything uh, that wasn't given to them by a family member. Um, any kind of pill or uh, to try anything like a vape or any, anything to smoke, um, you know, but I think a lot of it, even relating back to the first question, you know, part of the drunk talk, I think always has to be about helping our kids find something that fills up their cup. Uh, you know, like I said before, the opposite of addiction is human connection. So getting them connected with something that they feel excited about and, and that, that really kind of makes them, you know, feel good. Uh, and connected to other people, I think is vitally important. Thank you, Nate. Um, and I think for me, again, right, we're talking 10 year olds, you know, eight year olds, 18 year olds, and then we start to get into high school and, and, and college. Um, I think if we, again, approach it from a place of staying connected, um, empowering our children, right, and just it could be the smallest nuggets of I'm proud of you, but at the same time, being able to ask them an open-ended question to say, what did today look like for you? How did you feel? And share, right? I think as they get older, those conversations, we take advantage of them when we're driving them to every place they have to go five hours a day at times, right? Take me to the mall, take me to the movies, those times in the car just having those deeper discussions. I'm not even talking about substances, but rather building them up, listening to their stories um, and listening when they're in pain. Um, I think we all, so many of us who work in this space take our pain and turn it into purpose. I think we could teach that without those words from an early age and just begin, you know, begin that conversation of them believing in themselves, but letting them um, know that they're there. Um, Rocky, last one, and, and then I'll, we'll answer one more question because we're kind of nearing an end. Can you share with us any of the messaging that you did get from the youth that was empowered them? Um, some examples. Well, Sorry yeah, to put no, you on the so, spot, but. Yeah, no, so, I, so the main purpose of my work is to reduce the initiation of drug use. But yep. particularly over the last year, I've discovered there's an enormous population of kids who are suffering terribly, young kids suffering terribly from drug abuse in the home or the, home, the family environment. And they're not telling anybody. Mm -hmm. And these mm -hmm. kids will come up to me after my talks crying and they hug me and thank me and they share with me the pain that they're living in. And so the messaging is, if you're living any of that, if you're living any of the abuse that's so common from the families, it's not your fault. It's not your damn fault, I'll say in the schools. And if, if you're living it, please reach out for help. Find that trusted adult. Learn that there's a different future because of course the kids who grow up in suffering if they don't learn those different future, they repeat it when they have their own families. And I'm trying to break that cycle of generational violence through the work. I, recently, I was at a middle school in San Diego and a young African-American girl came up to me, 13 years old, waited till all the other kids left, came up and whispered, can I hug you? And I said, yeah. So I hugged her and she stepped back and said, thanks and, and walked away. And that's all it was, right? Well, as I left, the dean came up to me, goes, Rocky, that woman talk, that young woman talks to no adults, right? So this is one of the most traumatized, I don't know what her trauma is. But this is a child in such severe trauma that she won't talk to adults. And she came up after me to me, a stranger, 
to yeah. hug me and yeah. to thank me for this work. So this, this reimagining is telling the kids it's not your fault. We understand you. We don't blame you. You're not lesser. You're, we're all equal in this and we all support you and we care about you. That's mind bending. And that's what gets all these kids coming up to me and hug me because no one's telling them that. This isn't magic. This is not rocket science. I'm just being a human with them. And they're coming up and hugging me and crying. So I don't think I don't think we have to reinvent a whole lot to make a huge difference. We just need to start meeting the kids where the kids are and giving them some love and support. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially, you know, Nate, and if we think about harm reduction, right? It's really reducing harm in this space, right? Because, you know, harm reduction is just meeting that person where they're at, letting them, you know, them feel worthy and so that they can begin to um believe in themselves is, is sometimes the first step um yeah. and then i would love to follow that up with because i see a correlation nate when you think about your recovery there's all different definitions of recovery but again i'm thinking of reducing harm here right i mean I, we're not going to call it harm reduction prevention because there would be too many people after us saying you're it's over spoken about and there's so much stigma around it but in reality when we think about you know we put helmets on our kids heads when they're riding bikes we put seat belts on them when they're in the car um, we're always taking so how can we continue to you know, support them, love them and, and reduce harm. And, and I think a lot of it is like you said, you just, um, having them believe in someone and Rocky, I couldn't, you know, agree with you more. Um, sometimes the family is not the right person and there, it could be someone else. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I can share with you the first time, uh, that our shared that he was struggling we said to him, you've told us everything, like TMI, your whole life. Like, why couldn't you share this with us? And we thought he was going to come back and say, we were scared to tell you. But instead, he said, um, I love you guys so much. I just didn't want to disappoint you. Strongest message I ever that I share everywhere, right? Because again, when we talk about our youth, when we talk about these kids in school and college, Nate, when we're talking about people in recovery, we got to talk about the good stuff too, right? And and that was a beautiful statement, right? He loved his family. That's why it was nothing more than that. Um, so each one of you, you can talk about whatever you want. Um, any last thoughts, Nate? I was going to say to you, you know, beforehand, maybe your last thought. If you think of your younger self, if you could give a message to our youth, those supporting our youth, those working with our youth. Um, what do you wish you had, or what do you know now that you didn't know the way we started this conversation that you would like to share with our youth? Well, yeah, I think I alluded to it earlier a little bit when I was talking about empowering kids and uh, helping them understand that, yes, yeah, drugs do feel good, but what feels better ultimately is achieving those things that you thought about, the dreams that you wrote down when you were in kindergarten, that you wanted to be a firefighter, police officer, doctor, lawyer, veterinarian, whether it was a janitor, whatever it was that you wanted to help people work in a nonprofit, that the highs aren't as high, but again, the lows aren't as lows, aren't, aren't as low. And you can really truly have an impact on this world and you have a purpose and your purpose can be whatever fills up your cup. And that is going to feel way better than any 15 minute hour long high that you're ever going to get. And again, I really wish that I would have understood that better as a kid. And I do think that, you know, my family, there was a lot of openness there. But like you said, I didn't feel like I could go to my parents all the time. I didn't want to disappoint them. I don't want to let them down. I was afraid they were going to be angry. Um, so it was important for me to have people I could go to. And I did often go to other people. And that was really important in my story, too, was having other trusted adults. Um, so I always encourage parents to be involved in their kids' lives and be there for that conversation, but recognize that. Uh, it's important for kids to have people outside of maybe yourselves who they can talk to and rely on. Um, sometimes it's almost like the kids feel, I felt like I had kind of a, like a mediator between me and my parents. So they could help me explain it to my parents. Somebody's a little more right. mature, a little more life experience. I could tell them what's happening and they could relay it to my parents a little better. Um, and then the last thing I will say too, is as far as, you know, harm reduction, all that stuff, um, you know, one of the things that most profound things I ever heard was that we can treat substance use, but we can't treat death, you know, so that's why I think it is important for that, you know, to be able to strap that metaphorical helmet on people who are struggling um, and make sure we carry them through because 
we're losing so many people. And it's it, everybody that we're that's losing that we're losing is so valuable. Everybody has a purpose and a spot. And when and when we and when they leave, they leave such a huge hole. You know, we see these numbers talking about a hundred thousand people last year and the year before, but you could multiply that number by 20. That's the real impact that it's really having, you know? So that's why this is so important. And I really appreciate everybody that came on here today. And, you know, with that, I'll, I'll pick it back over to, to you with Rocky. Yeah, I'm gonna kick that one back to you, Rocky. Anything, whether it's your ambassadors or maybe say, what can you do when you le- hit the leave on this Zoom button? Anything we can do to, to change the conversation, create these ambassadors, even if we think of the lowest lift, um, you know, a takeaway for our audience. Well, we've got a great audience today and there's a lot of people that stuck in through the whole conversation and there's a reason that people were watching and everybody watching, I'm sure many watching are already involved in prevention efforts, but those of you who may not be, you can have an impact and you can create change in your world. Uh, Whether it's with your own family, your nieces, nephews, your grandkids, your neighbor's kids, Talk to your friends. Talk, share this. We have to. It, this is this is. We need everybody to step up. I mean, this crisis is hideous. It's massive. It's just getting bigger right in front of us. And and I don't think we have to do a whole lot to create a lot of change with the kids. I mean, we don't need to. We're not going to solve this overnight, right? But if we change the conversation, we begin to change the culture. We make the kids feel safe. We make the kids feel understood. Just that making the kids feel safe making the kids feel understood. And we're gonna have a lot less kids hiding their pain and, and, and trying to escape from it through the chemicals. So thank you everybody uh, for, for sticking with us and listening to the conversation. And, and uh, I'm just super proud to be part of Song for Charlie. And, and uh, I hope this is the first of many future conversations. Thanks, Nate. Um, and Rocky, Nate, I personally thank you. Um, I learned, we just met each other and I've learned so much from you both today. And I have a feeling uh, we'll, be friends forever. That's what happens in the work that we do. I know Nate, you know this, and Rocky, it's just when you find your purpose in doing this work. So hopefully we'll have, you know, a thousand more of us that want to talk next time. And I think, I don't want to simplify it, right? But like you said, to be kind to someone shows them to be kind to themselves, to believe in them, to reduce harm. Um, While it seems simple, In some ways it is. We're not asking schools, professionals, and everybody to put in this evidence-based, you know, program where we need data and we need to collect data. Like what if tomorrow we just all woke up and, you know, have a conversation of what we've um, learned from both of you. So I want to thank everyone who's joined us. It's hard to, we can only see ourselves, um, but we know there's lots of you out there. Um, Thank you for your support. we hope that you learned something new today. Again, we came from different lenses, but we we really were collaborative, infused into our message, right? And and honestly, I didn't think we'd come into that place. I thought we would come in many different lenses and it would be segregated in some way, but it just flowed and we all had the same message, right? Regardless of the pathway we, that we came to port, came from. Um, stay tuned for more information from National Fentanyl Awareness Day. Um, this was recorded for those, um, maybe friends and families, and we will be sending a survey to you and we can't thank you enough. And again, Nate and Rocky, um, greatly appreciate your time, your thoughts, um, and your huge hearts. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks everybody.